Okay. So we have uh, these uh, complication sessions. Uh, we have many cases submitted for this uh, case session. We selected uh, five cases. They are very interesting, and then uh, I assure you we appreciate the discussion also of this. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, you should have the courage to sometimes to submit your errors, your mistakes, and uh, we can learn from, from the other mistakes and uh, avoid to do the same mistakes in the future. I want to introduce the first, uh, uh, my co-chair is uh, uh, Jens Lassen, which is uh, here, and uh, then you have Francesca Sanguinetti, uh, which is the, the, the chair, and then we have a panel of uh, Dukan Din, Luc uh, Malar, Stephen Mott. Uh, I, I excuse if uh, the pronunciation is not uh, correct, but uh, Josica Sishik, uh, Hamid Reza Sanati, Amit uh, uh, Sangvi, and Okan Tagut. So it's, uh, we can start with the first uh, uh, presentation from Ina Kasia, uh, Kasianova. And uh, the name of the presentation is No Standard Complications require non-standard solutions. Hello, everybody. It's a great honor for me to be here and uh, present you our, uh, as I think, very interesting and uh, not so easy case. Uh, uh, not standard complication require non-standard uh, standard solution. Uh, the patient was quite standard, uh, 60 uh, years old female with no obese, with uh, uh, stable angina uh, class uh, two, three, uh, without history of previous myocardial infarction. Uh, ejection fraction was preserved, 58% uh, uh, with slight sign of uh, anterior hypokinesia. Uh, rest uh, ACG was normal, uh, baseline level of uh, creatinine was also normal, and she had strong family history. Her youngest, youngest brother had uh, uh, severe coronary artery disease with uh, first uh, presentation uh, as an acute myocardial infarction at the age of uh, 47 years. Uh, at the coronarography, you can uh, see the uh, significant lesion in the uh, proximal part of LED, and uh, as we decide, significant uh, lesion at the first uh, diagonal big uh, branch. Uh, at first glance, this uh, and no uh, no lesions in right coronary artery. At first glance, uh, it didn't look like a bifurcation uh, situation and uh, didn't require any uh, uh, any difficult uh, bifurcation um, procedure. That's why a uh, plan was to implant two independent uh, stents, uh, first to the diagonal and uh, second to the uh, LED. Uh, first was performed uh, direct stenting to the uh, diagonal branch without protrusion of uh, without protrusion to the uh, LED. Uh, after that was performed rewiring, uh, predilation in uh, LED, and uh, long drunk looting stent uh, 3.026 uh, millimeter was implanted to the uh, LED. But when we inflate uh, the stand, uh, we see uh, the place of uh, um, short, very short area where the stand was, uh, didn't expand. Uh, we perform a few times uh, um, post dilation with short high pressure balloon, but uh, it uh, didn't help to resolve this situation. And we perform a stent enhancement uh, study, uh, revealed short uh, stent uh, uh, stenosis at the place uh, across the uh, uh, ostium of um, diagonal branch, and I was was uh, performed at this uh, area and revealed two stent layers at the uh, place of um, uh, origin of diagonal branch, and at this moment we decide to stop and uh, to find something good solution for this patient. What, what solution <laughs> you choose? Uh, for, um, for making decision, uh, we decide to, uh, to explain uh, 
herself, uh, myself, uh, what what situation happened, and in this picture you can see what uh, the uh, alleged cause of this situation: uh, wire and stand uh, crossing. Uh, protruded uh, diagonal stand, uh, and uh, it can be reason of limited space to fall uh, uh, LED stand expansion. At this moment, we stop. Our patient didn't have any uh, complaints. Uh, we didn't find any uh, blood flow limitation, no ECG uh, changes. That's why we stop at this uh, moment. And uh, in a few days, our patient was discharged uh, with um, uh, aggressive double um, antiplatelet therapy. We used ticagrelor and aspirin. Uh, but she uh, had a strict uh, uh, outpatient follow-up. Uh, one time a week, she come to the hospital and we check with uh, ACG and uh, just uh, anamnesis. In a few months later, our patient uh, come back with uh, persistent uh, angina recurrent uh, angina, and we perform uh, repeated coronarography, which revealed uh, significant uh, proximal progression of atherosclerosis, significant stenosis at the ostium of uh, LED. Uh, at the first coronarography, this area was uh, unaffected, and the uh, stent construction was uh, at the same uh, state that uh, was uh, at the end of the first procedure. Uh, we perform repeatedly high pressure uh, balloon dilation, but uh, it uh, didn't uh, resolve the situation. That's why we have uh, prescribed uh, scenario for this situation, and we perform uh, and we decide to perform rotation, uh, rotational atherectomy. Uh, it's uh, the place of unexpanded uh, stent. We used uh, 1.5 millimeter booth with no uh, high speeds. Um, no any difficulties was with uh, putting wire and putting the bore, but after uh, three uh, rotablations, uh, high pressure balloon was uh, inflated and uh, was explained full without any problem. Uh, you can see it, and uh, we receive a uh, uh, good picture, but we understand that we have broked stand at the place of uh, uh, prevost stenosis and we have significant lesion uh, at the proximal part of LED. Uh, the stand uh, expansion was confirmed by uh, um, stand enhance and uh, we put another uh, long stand which covering uh, a new lesion and uh, damaged, uh, uh, which covered uh, broken uh, stand and uh, new lesion at the proximal part of, of LED. The final result was uh, uh, good. Uh, we uh, uh, was satisfied and uh, patient didn't have any complaints and was discharged. And in conclusion, um, I want to say that uh, in any case of any uh, complication, uh, you need to understand the nature of this complication to find the optimal uh, way to uh, solve it. A stent ablation uh, with uh, rotational atherectomy can uh, help to manage the underexpanded under and uh, underdilated stent, but uh, long-term results are not so good and not so uh, acceptable sometimes. And uh, non-standard uh, complication required non-standard -stand solution. That's our case. <laughs> Thank you for, for the, this presentation. I have uh, uh, some uh, question. I, I put some question. Uh, uh, what, 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 uh, what type of complication is this? So um, first, of, first question, which uh, type of stent you implanted in the side branch? Which brand of stent? Yeah, resolute onyx. And the diameter? 2.5. So first of all, you, you should know your stents. Now the resolute 2.5, which is a maximal expansion, 
And uh, uh, you should know that the Metronic made a, a modification of, the, of this stamp because it's, it's not a three uh, connections. So they put uh, more cells, more cells in the proximal one millimeter. So if you engage the cell, which is very close to the other, the expansion of this cell is, is uh, impossible to reach the other part of the, of, of the vessel. And um, Murasato presented a case report similar to this, he published in, in her intervention last year, and it was the nap nap napkin ring uh, complication because you are unable. So you should know the, which type of stent you, you implant, and also the size, because sometimes a 2.5, for example, Metronic, uh, has not the same expansion as 2.5 of other brands, which are, have the first, first stent. Uh, so if you, if you know your stent and you have this, you recognize immediately that there is this protrusion and then the wire is true. Uh, and you, you, should, you could avoid to over expand the string and just do an intern, a, a crash, crash the stent, convert in a crash. And, and the other question I want to ask you, how was the feeling? Because you didn't expand this side brain stent. You, you crossed with the, with the other stent directly, you did some ballooning. Uh, predilation uh, at the LED, but uh, we didn't have any difficulties to put the to cross, balloon to cross, to cross the, the. That's why. Uh, that's why uh, it was uh, unexpected because we have no difficulties with rewiring and. Uh, and the other the, the other comments that I have is uh, why to use rotoblator because you 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 rotoblated the LED, not the the other. So it's uh, I, and so probably the rotoblator didn't do anything. It was the high pressure that you used in the follow-up that was able to to rupture the the ring that was in the other side, and maybe it was not a complete rupture because there was some uh, some indentation still. We perform a few post dilation. At the first procedure, we perform few post dilation with high pressure, very short. Uh, balloon, uh, but it uh, didn't solve the problem. At the second procedure, we begin from the uh, post dilation with high pressure balloon, and uh, again, it uh, didn't work. That's why we uh, decided to use more aggressive tactic because high pressure balloon didn't help us. Another thing that you should have in your cat lab is to have balloons that go to 40 atmospheres. Sometimes they are available. And I think that it uh, can help us, but uh, it's very bulky device, and uh, we have dubs. Uh, can we put it inside or or, uh, or cannot? That's why. Uh, and unfortunately, we didn't have it. Uh, lab. This is my comment. If you have other comments, yeah. yeah, thank you for sharing a very nice case. I just have a doubt about the IVAS image that you showed. If if the stent has crossed through the proximal most cell of the diagonal and there is so severe narrowing because the cell does not open because of the connector or the design of the stent. The IVAS would not show such a large, the, the IVAS picture cannot be like this because then the inner cell through which the IVAS goes will be very, very small. Whereas the one that you showed, the diameter is almost 2.5 of the inner cell and the outer cell is three. So uh, where will be the outer cell? If it has gone through the cell, the outer cell you won't see in that same picture because those two will be fused. You will see two different cells proximally and distally, not at the site of the two cells. Uh, actually, I don't know. Uh, um, I have, n I didn't have many experience with uh, I was in interpretation in this situation. That's why for me it's uh, difficult to explain. But we uh, exactly uh, saw the two layers of stand. That's why they decide that it's a sort of protrusion, and uh, that's why they in, uh, inter interpret this picture like this. I think the napkin ring abnormality that you said is when you recross through the strut. Now in this case, there was already a wire in the LAD, and there's another wire in the diagonal. So why did she have to recross? She didn't recross. Uh, because because uh, um, because we didn't perform bifurcation, we used just one wire. Uh, maybe the best solution in this case uh, to use two wires from the first uh, first, first stage. It uh, it solve. Uh, we didn't. Uh, I understand it That's now, but uh, at the beginning of procedure, yeah. And another is to have a balloon assisted deployment because sometimes yeah. you can have a balloon there. So. You did yeah. two mistakes, not wires in a bifurcation, 
and you didn't use a balloon to assist. Now I understand it, but before procedure, I didn't think about it like a bifurcation stent. That's why it was just uh, uh, two simple stents to the two simple lesion. That's why. Uh, one more question. Uh, Okay. Uh, uh, the last two questions yeah. because we are I have a comment and a question. Uh, the, the first uh, c my comment, it's in my opinion. It's a spike of calcium rather than uh, nap can ring, uh, and I will ask the panelists about the experience in using uh, the root ablation in newly deployed uh, stents. Of, of course, you can you can root ablate a stent. We don't recommend it in the beginning because of heating and maybe complications. But if you're in serious trouble, it it is possible to do it and. There's several case uh, case reports, so it's 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 doable. The only okay. problem is that when you do use a balloon after ablation, you have uh, sometimes the balloon rupture, and then you have uh, other complication because uh, you yeah. <laughs> because of rupture you have this. Uh, but but just last, to last, just, last just, question. Yeah, uh, well, but, but maybe just to finalize everything, it's it's it was an excellent case, and it actually goes back to one of our very first consensus documents, <laughs> where we said we had difficulties in defining when a sideband was significant, and we discussed that a lot. But we decided to always recommend two wires, because then you would have avoided the, the complication. So, Remo, as you mentioned, balloon-assisted sideband stenting, we are also stenting the ostia with balloon assistance. So, that also has shown very promising results. Balloon-assisted ostial stenting. Yeah, balloon-assisted. Sometimes, uh, if you have, it depends on your guiding catheter, if you have a big side branch and you want to use balloon assistant, uh, seven branches uh, for the beginning is uh, well recommended or a wide uh, uh, guiding catheter. So thank you for uh, this first case presented by Christina Malik uh, Basic, and the title is Less is More. Thank you very much. Uh, I will show my complication case from uh, bifurcation PCI. So it was a 79-year-old lady. She came to our hospital because of chest pain and NSTEMI. And that was in, uh, in 2019. She had a history of arterial hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a myocardial infarction in 1985, which was treated conservatively. Uh, a colleague of mine was on duty, so he did the coronary angio. And there was a diffusely diseased RCA. And also, uh, which was uh, the culprit lesion because of the subocclusive stenosis in the mid segment, and a true LED D1 bifurcation lesion. So the colleague performed the PCI of the right coronary artery. You can see here that the right coronary artery also has a lesion in the distal part, it's the osteal uh, PD. But uh, my colleague was what, not so keen to do a complex uh, uh, PCI in this patient and he decided only to treat this mid and this proximal part with implantation of two drug eluting stents. So the patient come back, came back for this elective procedure on the LED. You can see here and the diagonal branch, it was two months later. I chose the transfemoral approach because I wanted to use a seven French guide. And uh, you, see, you can see here that uh, this is really a big diagonal branch. And the lady was almost 80 years old. I knew uh, that she didn't want to have a long procedure. So I thought, OK, I think I would do a provisional stenting approach. I don't know. We can comment later if somebody would go up front with a two stent technique in this bifurcation. So I wired both. Uh, vessels and I did the pre-dilatation with a semi-compliant 2.15 balloon and on the QCA the LED was about the distal LED the target was about 2.5 so I planted a drug eluting stent 2.515 at 14 atmospheres and after that I did a pot with a non-compliant balloon 3.0 and I was Obviously, it's not satisfied with the diagonal branch, so I did the rewiring with the whisper wire and did the dilatation of the ostium with the 1.12 semi compliant balloon and 2010 at 12 to 14 atmospheres. So, this was my result after 
this uh, pot site and I thought it was just a nice result. So what would you do now? Would you do now kissing balloons and then repot and there's also a lesion in the proximal LED and put a stand? Or would you just be satisfied with this result and say, okay, I keep it simple. I just do a repot and then stand a, do a stand proximally. Do you have any comments? Okay, do you think it's a good result in the side branch? Okay. There was no dissection. No dissection, no stenosis is more than 70%, it was maybe 5%. Okay. Sometimes you feel it confused to do it. I do systematic kissing, for example. In this case, I go for it. Okay, I thought also it could be better because I think the diagonal is bigger branch so also I would like to use a DCB so I will go with a non-compliant 2.5 balloon I will pre-dilatate then I will use the DCB and then I will do the repot and then understand the proximal part of the LED why not I think it's a bigger vessel it deserves a bigger balloon so I try to go with a 2.5-12 non-compliant balloon but it couldn't pass. Okay, I used a new semi-compliant balloon, a smaller one again, and inflated it at 18 atmospheres and the balloon ruptured. And then I was very surprised. Why have a, a perforation when the balloon was in the perforation and it ruptured because of barotrauma, I, I presume. So there I have now a problem which I wouldn't have had when I had done only a repot and the stenting proximally. So I took a balloon, now 2.15, and... Uh, it, it, yeah. This is distal to the bifurcation. Yes, very distal to the bifurcation. Yeah, you it there? No, I ballooned it in the bifurcation. The dice the di uh, distally, I was not there, I was not moving the, the wire, I was not there with the balloon because... The wire is always... No. I think it's because the balloon ruptured and the barrel okay, trauma. The as as yes. The, uh, no, no, it's not the spiral dissection. I don't know. Maybe in the balloon there was too much air or something. Another, another, uh, when you sure that you were in the distal strut, because I see this wire, which is... I'm not sure I was in the yeah, distal strut. Sometimes if you are in the proximal wire, you have this myocardina. Mm. When you go down, the myocardina punctures the balloon. So it's very important to be sure, because in this case you see that a little bit up, yes. Yes. Well, I was surprised, and then, okay, I took, uh, now I could pass with a bigger balloon, and I inflated it for about 15 so, minutes. This is just to, to, to if, you are, if you have a proximal cross, okay. could it cross this step with, with, with any device in the side? It is very so difficult. Cross, yes. So you have this new carina that interferes with the uh, Yes. So remember, the distal cross is Yes, so I couldn't place a graft, stand graft, and then I used the extension, as you see here, uh, extension catheter, and I was not able to cross with anything. Then the patient was obviously not well. She recovered after atropine and saline infusion, and uh, she complained about the duration of the procedure, and she became restless like me. So, well, I said, well, I have to do something and I was able finally to implant a drug eluting stand and I thought okay the extravasation is here but the echo with we did echo in the cat lab there was no pericardial effusion I'm fine I just leave the stand here and maybe everything will be fine and then I wanted to stand the proximal LED and then some colleagues said I think you have a dissection of the ostium of the LED fine, because of the extension catheter, fine. Now I have a trifurcation here. Wow, I have a ramus, a circ, I have the LED. I don't want to do it now. I just put a stand into the osteal LED. I think the lady will be fine with it. And it went well. So, this was the final result. Timmy 3 in the LED, Timmy 3 in the diagonal branch, 
There was no contrast anymore, I thought. The echo was fine. Uh, there is a slightly dissection in the osteal diagonal, but there is a Timmy tree flow. I don't want to go there anymore. And I was happy. Uh, stand graft, st uh, stand graft master. master so yeah, graft master. Yes, the, the old one, which is very bulky disease. Uh, we didn't have it then in 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 the cath lab. So it was a very bulky, bulky stand. So, okay, the bedside again ultrasound in the cath lab was fine. Uh, there was no significant pericardial infusion. I thought that the contrast staining was mostly in the myocard. She went to the ward, was very nice. And then after one hour, of course, she complained of chest pain and became hypotensive. She came back to the cath lab. There was, of course, pericardial effusion and tamponade. We had to do a pericardial synthesis and we evacuated about 300 milliliters of blood. And you can see here the pictal catheter. And now what can I do? I tried to put another drug eluting stent. Maybe overlapping of two stents will seal the problem. But it was not enough. And then I was, I don't know how and how, which strat I crossed the second time. But I was able to implant finally a stent graft 2.818 and it sealed the perforation. So the patient was fine, she was stable, she was in the coronary unit, and the next day the echo was fine, so the pigtail was removed and she was discharged home. And for me, the take home message was keep it simple, especially in older patients. Maybe it doesn't have to be perfect because they don't really tolerate long procedures and they are prone to complications. Maybe pot side pot would be enough for this patient. The, the, the result was okay. Be careful with extension catheters. We had some complications just two weeks ago. We had a patient with the CT of the right coronary artery. We want to do a LED and had a dissection of the LED, the left main and the circ. So she had in one moment occlusion of all three arteries and was in cardiogenic shock, but we managed to save her. And don't underestimate the coronary perforation. So I, I, my comment, uh, when you do a, in this case, a probable proximal crossing, and then you have this neocarin in the middle, and then you have a complication in the side branch, the first thing that you, you can do now is just do another pot, okay? Another pot to relocate the, the neocarina in the, in the original place. Doing another pot allows you to close the vessel, you have the perforation, and then you have maybe the time to, if you do another pot, to feel the, the feeling on the, on the side branch wire. If it is, you know, some friction, maybe it was proximal crossing. If you are distal, there is no, there is some tactical. And then re-engage immediately. You deflate the balloon, uh, the, the pot balloon, or you go with the double lumen catheter or micro catheter just to go distal and occlude the, occlude the vessel not to have a perforation. And then you have still time to do a distal crossing, do a, a opening the, st the strut, you don't need to do a kissing, just opening the strut and go with, a, with, with another stent. So this is another trick to, sometimes you can have difficulty when you do a, 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 this problem that you close, you do a pot to distal and then you are unable to go. Yeah, there is a complication described in the, in the paper. If you go to distal with the pot, you close, you recognize that you are in, in a proximal, uh, and then you have the time, the solution is to try again to go in another distal opening and then do what you have to do in the side branch, imaging, put in another stand, and, and then uh, finish with the kissing, etc., etc. Other question or comments? So we go on the third case, uh, stand fracture and the formation in distal left main, uh, cyan. Narayanan. Good afternoon to respected chairpersons, moderators, and colleagues. The title of my presentation is Ten Fracture and Deformation in this of May. I don't have any potential conflicts of interest to declare regarding this presentation. A 70 year old gentleman presented with a prolonged central chest pain and dyspnea trust. He had multiple cardiovascular risk factors. He was hypertensive, diabetic, and was a current smoke. 
at the time of presentation, his electrocardiogram showed ST elevation in 2 3 AVF and ST depression in V1 to V6. A quick bedside echo showed hypokinesis of entire inferior wall and inframatic wall. And ejection fracture estimate was 45%. So he was loaded with the antiplatelets and was transferred to cap lab for angiogram and early revascularization. So a right radial axis was obtained and a diagnostic angiogram showed a short left main. Circumflux was uh, totally occluded just beyond the ostium. And it was likely to be a dominant circumflux since the right coronary artery was a small caliber system. There was a hazy critical lesion extending from distal left main into the ostium of the LED. And the LED appeared to be diffuse disease and there was another area of uh, critical narrowing just beyond the diagonal ostium. So we proceeded with the intervention. The circumflux was wired, multiple rounds of thrombus aspiration, restored flow into the infarcted artery and patient became hemodynamically stable with relief from chest pain and uh, resolution of EC changes. And the check angiogram showed that the circumflex was a dominant system. We then proceeded with the intravascular ultrasound evaluation. The, this is the intravascular ultrasound pulled back from the distal circumflex. The distal circumflex reference vessel, uh, um, reference vessel diameter was three millimeter. There was a diffuse plaque seen extending from distal circumflex just beyond the origin of the optus margin. And there was an area of critical narrowing at the site of optus margin origin where there was a mixer plaque with some areas of superficial calcium. The MLA at that site was 2.37 millimeters squared and plaque burden was 82 percent. The intravascular ultrasound pullback further showed that the plaque was seen extending proximally and at the site where the circumflex was uh, totally occluded, there was a fibroatheromatous plaque with the luminal compromise. And in ostium, the plaque burden was 64 percent and vessel diameter was 4.1 millimeter. This is the intravascular ultrasound pullback from the distal LED. The distal LED reference vessel diameter was 3.3 millimeter. There was a mixed plaque and with the areas of high attenuation at the site where the diagonal was originating and the plaque was seen extending proximally. And at the ostium of the LED, the MLA was 4 millimeter squared with plaque burden of 75 percent. The vessel diameter at that site was 4.5 millimeter. In the distal left main, there was high attenuation plaque, especially from 5 to 9 o'clock position and the lumen area at that site was 3.9 millimeters squared. And ostium, the plaque burden was 71%. And the vessel diameter at that site was 5.6 millimeter. So intravascular ultrasound evaluation uh, revealed that the vessels were diffusely diseased. And the uh, disease was extending all the way from left main ostium into the daughter primus. In the case of circumflex, it was extending beyond the obtuse marginal origin. And in the case of LED, it was extending beyond the diagonal origin. The left main appeared to be short, I have to significant narrowing all along the left wing. So the strategy was a stepwise promotional side branch and strategy in mid circumflex optus marginal bifurcation and same strategy in LAD diagonal bifurcation. And since the left main was diffusely diseased with the lesions extending to LAD and circumflex ostia, we applied an upfront two stud strategy in left main bifurcation with plan to extend the stand up to left main ostia. So the circumflex and optus marginal wired pre dilated the mid circumflex lesion with a 2.7 balloon. Extended across the optus margin with a 3 into 28 mm regulatory extent, which was deployed at 14 atmospheres, and followed by port with a 4 mm balloon at 14 atmospheres. Angiogram confirmed well deployed stent. So after that, we shifted to the LED diagonal system. The diagonal was wired, proximal LED was sprayed alight with a 2.5 mm balloon, extended across the diagonal with a 3 into 33 mm regulatory extent, and then port was performed with a 4 mm balloon with good results. For distal left main, the concentrations were that the Bifurcation was an obtuse angled bifurcation. There was no significant mismatch between left main and daughter branches. Since the left main diameter appeared to be around 5 mm, and intravascular ultrasound showed that the vessel diameter in the proximal LED and proximal circumflex was 4 mm. So the plan was to perform a double kissing clot. So we placed a 4 into 21 mm drug loading stent from left main into circumflex and deployed at 14 atmospheres. And when the balloon was inflated, we can see that there was a waste at the circumflex host. A stent boost images confirmed that stent is underexpanded at uh, the ostium of the circumflex. A port was performed at left main with a 5 mm balloon at 16 atmospheres, followed by post dilatation at the osteoproximal circumflex with a 4 mm non compliant balloon at 18 atmospheres. LED was then recrossed, struts were pre dilated with a 2.5 mm balloon. And kissing balloon dilatation with the 4 mm balloons were performed. And during the kissing balloon dilatation, just notice that the circumflex balloon was not expanding properly and there was a waste. And once the balloons were deflated, we noticed that there was a significant uh, break in the outline of the stent which was placed from the left main into circumflex. And there was transection and discontinuity of the outline. And towards the left main, distal left main, there was uh, the stent appeared to be crowded with and collapsed, suggestive of deformation. 
so at this point we can have a discussion of the problem if you have suggestion what what can be what uh, the solution in this case usually in my case i have the the shock wave so it, 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 with a big vessel like this, uh, I usually I go directly with the, with the shock wave uh, I have in the shelf. The other things to remember is that if you go with a balloon, especially a big balloon, which is just for all balloon, when you if the balloon doesn't inflate, okay, or you have a fracture, when you remove the balloon, the wings of the balloon can catch the stent, and then you have uh, you know you increase the probability to to de uh, have a longitudinal deformation of the stand toward the proximal part. So maybe it's, it was not fractured, but you, you, you pull part of the stand and then you detach the stand from, from the position, the original position. So this is my interpretation of this. Uh, other comments or suggestion about this complication? Otherwise we can go on with the, with the case. Yeah, if you have a, it depends on the connection of the stand. If you have three connections, is, uh, uh, but when you have this uh, very default, so with two or three connections, uh, you have uh, the probability, for example, for a, uh, with two connectors, uh, is a higher probability to have this deform longitudinal deformation as demonstrated with the well known uh, fewer connections than I don't nominate, but uh, you know. I'm still a bit confused with that Ivis picture. Did he recross into the circumflex? Because to me, it almost looks as if he might have recrossed and sort of gone between struts in and out kind of thing. Because if your stent, I mean, when he deployed the stent, if it was as tight as we can see on that Ivis picture, he would have seen a waist that's like, you know, piss tight. So, and that's not what we're seeing. So to me, it almost looks as if he must have recrossed, gone sort of behind strength you know, in and out of stent struts, and he's now crushed a bit of the stent against the side. I, I, I my impression was that the, the waist was distal to the bifurcation, was in the proximal part, uh, not the bifurcation. It was a paraosteal uh, hardening plaque, then uh, probably uh, removing the balloon, uh, it was like uh, to be, it's, it's not inflated, especially, uh, uh, I, Okay, I had, I had the case that I removed completely the stand. I do the, the kissing balloon. Yes, I do the kissing with the four, four, five, and four O balloon. And then when I, I deflated the balloon, but uh, my, I, I was used to pull back the balloons together. But it should not. Until the balloons are in the guiding catheter, it should not put together. So one balloon at a time in the guiding catheter and then together. I did together and then uh, some friction because four, five, and four O. And then I remove everything, the wire were there. And then when I, I removed the stand, the stand was in, at the tip of the two balloons. So there was no stand. I, I extracted the stand completely. Because with the wings of the stand, you can really. And it was uh, a lower type of stand yes. that I, I told you. With the bigger balloons, you don't need to put a lot of dye. Because when you deflate it, yes. and it also makes remember, wings. And you can it's, pull you are, the stand yeah. while you are taking and, it And then out. when I removed, I, 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 I checked the balloon, the 4-5 balloon. And then when it was completely deflated, the wings were so, it was like a, like a, like like a glue. flat balloon. Like, like glue, glue yeah. attached to the metal yeah. of the stand. And there are also areas where there was partial uh, fractures, which is defined by more than one third of the circumference uncovered by the stand struts. And especially towards the ostium circumference, there were absent stand struts from 3 to 6 o'clock position. And in the point of conference, there were absent stand struts from three to seven o'clock position. The mid shaft, the stent studs, the stent geometry appear to be intact. So we changed the strategy. Stent struts towards the LED was opened again with a 2.5 balloon, placed a four into 15 mm drug loading stand from ostium of the left vein into the LED, followed by pot with a five mm balloon at 16 atmospheres. Then after that, circumflex was reaccessed. Kissing balloon dilatation with four mm balloons in LED and circumflex were performed. At this point, we noticed that the circumflex balloon was expanding properly, followed by repot with 5 mm balloon at 16 atmospheres. Then we placed a 4 into 12 mm drug loading stand at circumflex ostium in a tap fashion. After that, a kissing balloon dilatation was performed after pulling back the balloon slightly to the left wing. Cardiovascular ultrasound pulled back from distal circumflex. The stand appeared to be well expanded and opposed in distal and mid portions. In the osteoproximal circumflex where there was a stent fracture, the lesion appears to be well covered and in the ostium of the circumflex, the minimum stent area obtained was 10.5 mm squared.
This is the intravascular ultrasound pullback from the LED. The distal and mid portions the stent appear to be expanded properly. And the ostium of the LED, the minimum stent area obtained was 10.7 millimeter square. In the distal left main, the stent appeared to be well expanded opposed, and uh, the minimum stent area obtained in left main was more than 13 millimeter square at distal mid and proximal shaft. And this is the final angiographic results. There was no residual lesion, and the uh, flow there was good flow in both LED and superflux. There are multiple predictors of uh, the complication which has been described to happen between 60 days to 4 years after the implant. When we place the stent in angulated branches, this can potentially alter the vessel geometry and interactions between the torsional movements and uh, the metal and lead to metal fatigue later and potentially lead to fracture at a later date. The first generation triglutic stents, especially cipher stents, are more often associated with this complication. But there are also reports that the second generation triglutic stents can also be associated with fractures. In a series of patients who uh, underwent Everolimus eluting stent implant, the incidence of stent fracture was dis described was around 2.9 percentage. When we use overlapping stents, that can induce axial stress along the vessel wall and these uh, overlapped portions can serve as hinge points where the vessel can potentially fracture at a later date. When we implant stent in vessels which are affected by considerable motion during the uh, cardiac contraction like right coronary artery and uh, saphenous vein graft, that can also uh, serves as a potential areas of uh, stock fracture later. When we implant longer stents in smaller vessels, that can lead to stent stock fracture at a later date. And among the clinical predictors, patients who have chronic disease and hypercalcemia and calcified lesions are can also described to be associated with this complication in literature. Our patient is unique in that the stent fracture was recognized immediately after the implant, after the post dilatation. And there were several predictors which has been associated with this complication. We placed the stent in hostile location where the recoil is maximum. There was acute angulation, there were overlapping stents, and we performed high pressure dilatation. All could have contributed to stent fracture uh, immediately after the implant. And stent enhancement views are very useful to detect stent fractures, and intravascular imaging would help to define stent fracture and plant treatment in patients who are affected by this complication. Thank you for the patient care. So, so to summarize this, there was a stent fracture. The operator finished with a plan procedure, which was decay culotte, because he had to put he put the first stent in the circ, and then he had to finish with the culotte because the also LED, and then he, he crossed, and then uh, he did a T, uh, a provisional T. So it was a decay culotte plus a provisional T where there was the fracture or the modification. Yeah, was it the fracture? That does uh, practically doesn't match a fracture or deformation. There was a gap there, and, sh and uh, you have to finish your plan, which was decay culotte, and then uh, cover the the part that was not covered by stent. Wait, wait. What was the stent in the circumflex? The type of stent? Yeah. What type of stent did you implant? That was uh, that was uh, thin strut percolation. It was an ultimaster stand. It was 421 mm ultimaster stand. Ultimaster stand. So it's thin struts and also less connections. Uh. Okay. Thank you. From uh, Jessica Sikic, uh, which is a stand dislodgement, coronary perforation, cardiac tamponade, and uh, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you so much. I don't have just one complication in this case. I did it more together with my colleagues. So, this case started uh, with non STMI, and uh, this lady who was born in 1956 uh, had um, a torsade point also, and she was transferred to CCU and after that to the CAT lab. And that was her previous history. So she already had a myocardial infarction in 2007. And she was treated with uh, BMS because at that time we don't have a drug looting stent. And uh, she also had um, a PCI of LED uh, with BMS. And a year later, uh, due to extension of atherosclerotic disease, she received another stent. It was also BMS. And then we treated the complication of a BMS, and that was a late instant restenosis, which he had in 2014. 
And then again, four years later, she had a myocardial infarction on the RCA. It was a late instant occlusion, and we treated that with two drug eluting stent. She had also hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, atherosclerosis of the peripheral artery, and she was a smoker. And uh, then she transferred to the uh, cat lab, and this is the chapter one. So, uh, as you can see here, she had occluded uh, RCA, but this uh, ACX was the culprit lesion. And uh, at that time, it was my younger colleague in the cat lab, and it was uh, looked like an easy uh, procedure. But um, uh, as you remember, she already had uh, implanted stent, stent in the ACX, and at that time, we don't had, have um, uh, imaging techniques. So uh, she uh, tried to open this uh, uh, ACX. She put a, a wire, she balloned it, and she tried to implant this uh, science, but what happened, she lost the wire and she lost the stent as well. So uh, this uh, stent was uh, protruded a uh, little bit with the, in the left main with a few struts. And then she uh, called me to help her because I'm uh, older. So now we have a problem because uh, we have a, a lost stent in uh, ASIX without a wire and we have uh, also a protruded uh, stent in the left main. So I tried to uh, put the wire uh, through the uh, stent and I tried with the BMW uh, Elite and then I finally crossed with the pilot. And uh, my idea was to inflate the stent uh, in the distal part of the, uh, this dislodged stent and just pull it out. And I thought that it will be a good idea, so I did it with this, that 1.5, but I think uh, I showed that that uh, stent was uh, too, too thin because I just passed through that stent and I just, as you can see in this um, uh, right uh, part, right, right picture, I just uh, move out that uh, uh, this large stent a few millimeters into LED, and it was wasn't protruded with just with only few struts. Right now, it protruded completely over the uh, LED as well. So my question is, what would you do now with this situation? <laughs> so you were across the stent with the with the wire. You are sure, and you crossed with the. Yes. You removed the stent. Yes. Yeah. Now we have a wire. Yes. Say, and you have more protrusion in the left main. Yes. You have a snare. You can snare. You go with the snare and you snare everything. This is the you know the first solution, which mm -hmm. is because it's in the left main outside the guiding catheter. Mm -hmm. And this is my first uh, choice. Usually. I tried, but it uh, didn't work. Uh, you tried with the with the with the snare. Yes, I tried. Okay. It didn't work. Uh, if you try with the snare, then the, there are solution uh, because if you do other maneuver, you can have two wires to to envelop to go with two or three wires to try to to with the snare to, to remove. But you have to pay attention because if uh, you deform the stand, then you lose the stand in the aorta. So you have to think about crushing the stent with the, with an additional. Uh, this is the most safest way to. That's what I did. So I passed with the two wires uh, with, uh, through the um, over the um, upper part of the stent. Uh, I help. I was. Uh, I use um, a stent boost and stent boost alive. So I was sure that I am in the right position. And I crushed the stents with the balloon. So uh, first I use a balloon for a left main and LED, and then to ACX, and then I implanted stent in the ACX, and then I implanted stent in the LED. I recross the wire and I perform a kissing balloon, and this was the result. And geographically, it was a good result, and I was uh, really uh, happy because of that. 
but only angiographically because I know that I uh, didn't uh, uh, do a report because I was a little bit afraid of the report. Be which technique do you use for the two stents? Is it a T or it's yes, a T stent technique? T stent. Yes. And I didn't perform a report of the left main because I was afraid of that protruded stent. And because she was stable, I planned to, to let her go to the CCO and then to, because she also received a lot of contrast at that time and uh, she became uh, not uh, very well and uh, not very comfortable to, to stay at the, uh, at the table. So the idea was to bring her back to the CCO and see how what will happen and after that I will do optimization. So that is uh, chapter 2, part 1, optimization. Because uh, I let her home and uh, after a three weeks or a month she uh, she came again to the cat lab and this was the result of a previous uh, uh, procedure so as you can see that is uh, not very well expanded stent in the acx and not very well expanded stent in stent in the lad as well but this this large stent is completely covered with uh, uh, with the uh, stents as you can see as I saw on the uh, with the stand boost, but when I perform this OCT, this in the middle part, I show that I saw that there is a lots of problem with the stand because there is a not very well expanded stand in the left main and also I'm not satisfied with this picture and also also as you can see this this large stand which is not very good stick to the to the wall and there is also a empty area around it so i took uh, aquiforce i took a track i post dilatated and uh, after that i post dilatated it this uh, um, um, stands in the a6 and then also stand in the led and uh, left main and uh, this was the result so the, the optimization I thought that is uh, good with this uh, uh, NGO I showed no no uh, residual stenosis and you can see also stand boost that uh, all stands are very well expanded and on the uh, this and the vidocity I showed that uh, this uh, osteal part are very well without uh, any problems with the uh, uh, this large stent and uh, any other uh, stress stent uh, as well. So I thought that I am finished, that I did a good job and the patient was good. And I sent her back to the ward but, and I went home. But a few hours later they called me because uh, she became hypotensive and in a cardiogenic shock and she had a tamponade. So I was thinking okay she had a tamponade oh my god that can be only due to this large stent in the left main because I uh, did uh, that optimization and I was so worried about it because uh, if it is really true that I, I don't know what solution will be for her how to treat this this patient so I brought her back to the cat lab but as you can see here, it wasn't it wasn't uh, uh, this large stent. I perform uh, I perforate the vessel with the wire it, in the uh, distal part of the vessel. As you can see, it was completely distal. So I was happy. Okay, it's very distal. I, I can treat it very easy, maybe with a coil. But I didn't have a coil with that size at the cat lab, so I asked another cat lab and they didn't have it as well. So I said, all right, then I will take that bulky graft master and I will put that graft master. But, and then but, <laughs> to occlude it, because I kept this uh, um, perforation with the balloon, but uh, this perforation didn't stop with the balloon. <laughs> and another idea was to take um, uh, fat and to occlude it. And also I called my colleague for, from uh, vascular surgery, did they have some kind of glue to put it there, but they didn't. 
So I took that graph master what was a disaster because that stent um, which I had uh, uh, in uh, ACX, which was implanted, that BMS stent, which was implanted uh, during the first myocardial infarction, wasn't uh, uh, expanded very well. So I stick with that uh, uh, graft master and I feel that I am losing it. So I inflate, it, inf uh, inf uh, inflate that uh, graft master in the, in the mid pot. And um, as you can see there. And uh, after that, finally, that, um, uh, that bleeding stopped. So I s said to myself, okay, stop. So it is not just a straight perforation. It is um, some kind of uh, flap. And I implanted the drug looting stent and everything stopped. And patient was well and she is still well. And this was her final result. So I think that I did more than one mistake here. Some of them is not because, because of myself, but some of them does. So I think that we should take care about uh, a previous uh, stent implantation as well. We sh should take in focus not just the part we are treating, but all the part of the vessel. And sometimes the easier way is not always the best we have to take in account uh, all possibility if we have some uh, procedure like that. Other comments? You know, uh, the fat is very, there is a Ibrilakis video how to prepare the fat. It's very easy. We have to, 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 to use a needle to prepare the fat and then with the micro catheter you go down and you inject the fat. It's yeah, just... Uh, it's a good way if you don't have the coils. When you do complex cases, these things occur frequently. So this is very important at the end of the procedure to check what you have done around, all around. Do not focus on the left man that you have treated nicely with a very good result. And then you forgot to see that the wire was too much distal and you make the perforation. So this is first thing. It should be a rule in all cases, especially if you do a complex case. And the second command is that if you, you should have something to close a hole in the distal vessel. So it's very important. But if you have not, you have a very simple technique. The fat is not so easy to do. Not easy to insert the fat in the, in the microcatheter. But you can just use a balloon. So you cut the balloon in the middle, you push it distally, and you close the hole. So it's very simple. Of course, it's not something that... Uh, uh, we are talking about because people want to sell other things, but it's very useful if you have nothing on board, cut the balloon, push it with a microcatheter or with another balloon, and it will deploy like a parachute in the distal uh, vessel. So, uh, Remo, what we do is, after, as Dr. Thierry mentioned, it should be a rule to image the... We take a simple PA view. Simple PA view gives everything in distality. Circumflex distal, LED distal, and very often, if you, especially with a junior colleague of you, they tend to be a little, uh, I'm not saying rough with the wire, but they underestimate the potential of the wire to perforate. So just take a PA view. The last shot should be the PA view. It gives you everything in distal, distality. Thank you. So the last presentation is from Pablo Vidal Cales, nailing the bifurcation. So, uh, good afternoon. I am Pablo Vidal Cales, uh, Interventional Cardiology Fellow from Hospital Clinic of Barcelona. Uh, I wanted to thank the European Bifurcation Club for allowing me to present this case. And uh, it's great to be here in Madrid, which is my city. And uh, also to Dr. Salvatore Brugaleta, my mentor, uh, that uh, encouraged me to, uh, to present the case and to share it with uh, everyone here. So the case is called nailing the bifurcation, and I start with the case presentation. It's about a 54 years old male, a former smoker with dyslipidemia and diabetes, with an honesty elevation myocardial infarction in November 2021, and a coronary angiogram then uh, with a right coronary artery with severe uh, mid lesion that was treated with one stent, and that was okay. And then uh, a left coronary angiogram that I want to uh, discuss uh, 
with more detail. So here there is a left main with a 20% distal lesion uh, and a left circumflex with a moderate 50-60% proximal lesion and a LAD with a definitely severe 80% proximal lesion. This case was uh, performed in, in another center, not in our center. That's, that has to be done. So the, the lesion was treated uh, with, a, with the placement of an angiolite uh, drug eluting stent in the OSTL LED uh, and then a pot with a 3.5 uh, non-compliant balloon. So this is the final angiographic uh, result. The left circumflex was left uh, untreated uh, and was left untreated uh, depending on the follow-up of the patient and symptoms, uh, etc. So if the follow-up at first, uh, it was okay. The patient was asymptomatic for one month, but then he developed progressive angina that didn't improve with uh, optical medical therapy. So uh, non-invasive tests were performed. ACMR uh, showed no is ischemia but the echo stress showed angina in the test with EKG changes, but without echo changes. So there was a little bit of discordance between the non-invasive tests uh, and the, and the wow. symptoms of the patient. So finally, a new coronary angiogram was requested and was performed by us in this summer, in August 2022. So this is what we see in the follow-up. I'm sorry. And I wanted to, I, I put the images and I want, I want to ask uh, what happened here and what would be your, your approach. Okay. No, I was just telling, I, I'm feeling a little bit you know, old file, but there is nobody putting two wire in a bifurcation, even if we don't want to stand it. No, 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 it's, it's a little bit joke, but I think I, it, it takes 30 seconds and uh, and uh, it's a, it's a se your safety line in and the first case was the same thing and the second thing uh, again i'm feeling a little bit of vintage but the 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 refusing a bifurcation is not uh, the simple way to to do some sometimes i think we have to consider if the the lesion is really next to the ostium to uh, to do the bifurcation even if the, uh, the CERC ostium is not a disease uh, at the beginning. So just... uh, can you go back uh, to the uh, positioning of the stand in the image, the first images? Okay, this one, the first one, this one. Yeah. In motion. On the left. On the left, okay. What you see here, you see that the stand uh, clearly is moving. When you see this move, Mm -hmm. never, never do. You have two balloon assisted, uh, balloon assisted stand deployment. So two wires, put the balloon, then you trap the, 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 the moving because you, with the balloon you trap and then you have all the time to position correctly a snaring. Otherwise you finish with the... So I, I want to point out that the case, uh, the first case was from another center. So I, I have no... <laughs> You I can never perfectly to, nail the ostium of the LED. It always, there's always black in the distal left main in the mm -hmm. LED, so you have, you have to cross over. I mean, did you IVIS this before you stented or just angiogram only? That it was from another center, oh, okay. so that's, uh, I, I can't uh, answer. I'm sorry. Uh, so the second, this uh, coronary angiogram was performed uh, at our center. And well, what we, what we did here is uh, we put two wires in the LED and the left circumflex, we rewired, and we, uh, we use intracoronary imaging to check the position of the wire, and we perform also a functional uh, assessment because the patient had severe symptoms, but the non-invasive tests were a little bit uh, confusing, so we wanted to match the severity of the lesion with the patient's symptoms. So, there was a DFR in the left circumflex of 0 0.5, so clearly positive. And we did uh, coronary uh, imaging. And we're going to, what we're going to see there is a, a protrusion of the LED stent into the left main. 
and uh, we see that this protrusion uh, contributed to the to the circumflex lesion by uh, atherosclerotic plate protrusion into the left circumflex. Also, we check that the, the wire it was correctly uh, I mean the rewired the rewiring it was uh, correctly performed. So this was our simple bif bifurcation approach. We did a kissing balloon with three uh, 10 millimeter non-compliant balloons, and then we we put a drug coated balloon, an essential drug coating balloon, at eight atmospheres during 40 seconds, and finally a pot with a 3.5 uh, non-compliant balloon. Uh, we didn't have uh, we, we didn't have another balloon available, and also the left main and the LED size was pretty similar, so we were uh, we were quite comfortable during this uh, using this balloon. So this is the intracoronary imaging post and we're going to see at the uh, in the in the region of the bifurcation with the left circumflex that we have a good opposition, a good expansion and also the struts are more open to the left circumflex. Here we're going to see it. Okay, so the intracoronary image, also the left main uh, didn't have a dissection. This is the pre and post uh, to summarize. So with a wider area in the bifurcation place uh, after, the, after the procedure. And the final angiographic result uh, was this. So it was a nice result. Also with a DFR that was clearly better than before with uh, 0 0.95. So in one month follow-up, like one month uh, ago, the patient was free of angina. He was okay, feeling okay. And no further complications were reported. So to conclude, first, the provisional stent strategy requires careful meticulous assessment and treatment of the bifurcation anatomy, especially when the nailing the osteum technique is considered. Uh, so the pitfalls of a previous bifurcation technique may be corrected by knowing the different steps, the previous images uh, using the prior PCI. And in our case, it was important because it was from a different center. And uh, finally, the intracoronary imaging provides uh, valuable incremental information that the angiography may uh, underappreciate. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. That's it. Thank you for, I have a, a final comment. There is a paper by Tot, I think, uh, in her intervention that uh, when you do this uh, pot, you over the stent uh, and you do the nailing in the osteal LED or osteal left main, you don't shorten the stent, but you elongate the stent. So they suggest not when you have to do this nailing to avoid to go exactly to the osteum because when you post the LED stent, the stent will elongate and will protrude in the left main if it's in osteal LED or in the aorta if it's uh, in aorta. So this is a, and there is a good fil film also demonstrating that when you over expand the stent with the one millimeter bigger balloon than the, than the stent uh, diameter, then you have a, a, a sometimes one or two millimeter. Yeah. Similarly, we, we did a bench testing uh, just recently. So if we stand from the left main to the LED, suppose, and we start and we start doing a pot from the carina and we come towards the guiding catheter, the stents keep on keeps on elongating. Yeah. Whereas if we start the pot at the ostium of the left main, the stent gets fixed to the wall, and then you go distally and do yes. the pot, the stent doesn't elongate. Because you elongate, the, you, 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 Fix the you stent pull, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you. And this happens in the LED ostium also. So if you put a LED osteal stent, and then you start optimizing the stent from the mid LED up to the ostium, two, three struts come in front of the circumflex, which were not there to begin with. And so the, finally the stent is malaposed and lying in front of the circumflex, and that is why, yes. and the cells are closed. And that is why the circumflex comes back with a vengeance. Yeah. Whereas once we do a crossover, the cells open with a pot, so the circumflex flow is very good, so it doesn't reach to nose that badly. These are all complications of pot. You know, we have new complications because with the new technique that you use, these complications were not uh, <laughs> known before pot. So we have to learn from these uh, cases that uh, pot should be used correctly, and uh, also the stand positioning maybe should modify compared with the past.
I think that we can uh, finish this session. It was uh, instructive and I hope that you enjoyed also.